Turn to Matthew 15. Matthew 15 is, doesn't seem like a big story. Actually, this story is going to be found also in Matthew. It's in, found in Mark, Luke, and John. It seems like a very insignificant story. But it is very significant in the relationship between Jesus and the Jewish leaders. This is sort of a break when they really start becoming enemies. But before we get into this, this passage to me is it's dealing with a simple question. And the question to me is this. Specifically, what kind of behavior is God looking for in true believers? What does he want to see? What does he want with regards to behavior does he want on a daily basis? And as I was uh, contemplating this, I was going over a book with my son this past Tuesday. We were studying a book for men, and in his book, Joe pointed out this, this statement. And I think this statement summarizes what we're going to study today perfectly. Here's the statement. It's by Augustina Hippo. He says this, love God, love God, and then do whatever you please. Like this is going to sum up perfectly what we're going to talk about. But when you look at that phrase, it doesn't sound right. Because your eye jumps to the second part. Do whatever you please? That's not pleasing to God. Aren't we here to serve Him? But it comes after the first part. The first part is very simple. If you love God, then what you will be compelled to do will be pleasing to God. So in a sense, the thing that pleases you pleases God. In fact, that's the whole point of the Old Testament. That's the point of grace. That's the point of Jesus' ministry. It's all about getting your heart changed. Because if you can change what's inside, then everything that comes out will be different. And what the story is today is the way the world looks at religion. We look at the outside thinking if we change the outside, it will work its way out to the inside. That's not true. It starts on the inside. So the title of this message is called Dirty Hands, starting in Matthew 15, 1 through 20. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem, and they said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, and why do you break the commandments of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother... What you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father and mother. So, for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plan that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides, and if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat without unwashed hands does not defile anyone. And so this is the issue. The issue is very simple. The disciples and Jesus probably after they maybe, maybe tore up the loaves of bread and the fish, 
their hands were dirty, and they started eating with dirty hands. And the Pharisees see him, and they say, uh-uh, no, that's against our traditions. So the Pharisees go up to Jesus and said, hey, I thought you were holy. I thought your disciples were righteous men. Look at them, violating the traditions that we set. They must not be holy at all. That's what's going on. Why are they so mad? What is going on? Like, look at verse 2. I mean, they're really ticked. You look at, listen to their voices. Their voices really are, they're, they're condemning. They're critical. They come up to Jesus and they say, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elder? I mean, they're mad. Why are they so mad? Well, let's, first of all, look at the context. The context starts chapter 14, 34 to 36. 34 to 36, when the disciples and Jesus got out of the boat, remember last week there's a storm, they get out of the boat, it's in the town of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent around to all that region and brought to him all who were sick and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. It's an amazing story. They hear Jesus is in town. They get all their brothers, sisters, and relatives who are sick. They just touch Jesus' garment, and they're all made well. I can imagine a thousand people got well. Well, this goes to the city of Jerusalem where the Jews run the religious order, and they're mad. They don't like this fame that Jesus is getting. So they head up to Galilee, where all of this stuff is going on, and they confront Jesus. They don't like it. And so they're looking for anything to discredit his ministry. They're looking for any flaw in Jesus' armor. If you're political, you understand this. Anytime somebody on the other side says something you don't like, anytime maybe the president says a gaffe, Anytime somebody does something stupid like doesn't wear a mask, we are quick to say we condemn their whole political position. It's really what the Pharisees are doing here. They're looking to condemn Jesus. Why? Well, because he's making a mockery of their traditions. This is what false religious people do. They scrutinize, they judge, they look down on the person who doesn't meet their standards of outward holiness. You could be the greatest person in the world, but if you don't wear a tie to church, uh-oh. You could be the nicest neighbor, but if you don't get to the door of the church when it's open every day, you are a slacker. You don't meet standards. In this case, here's what basically was happening. In the Old Testament, the book of Exodus chapter 30, there's some prescriptions for priests. And basically, the prescriptions for washing of hands are relegated to the Levites. Exodus chapter 30, verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, You shall make a basin of bronze with its stand of bronze for washing. So they're supposed to go, they have a big bowl of bronze, and pour water in there. And so before the priest goes in, he's to wash his hands in his feet, and then he can do the sacrifice. If you notice in Exodus, it has nothing to do with just normal, everyday eating. So what they basically did is they turned this statute that was meant only for the Levites into a statute that was meant for everybody, and they said, if you're going to be righteous, you better clean your hands before every meal. And so what they instituted for really religious Jews was before you went to the meal, they'd have a basin. You'd roll up your sleeves, and you'd dip your hands in, and go all the way up to your elbows, and then you'd let it drip off the end of your fingers. And then you could eat. But this really has nothing to do with hygiene. Nothing to do with hygiene. Everything to do with, look how holy I am. It's all symbolic. It's all symbolic. And if you don't comply, you stand condemned. That's the problem with legalism. Legalism 
sounds good at first. Like, it, yeah, it's a good thing to wash your hands, but it's really not about washing hands. It's about looking good to everybody else on the outside. So legalism sounds good, but it becomes a rigid law meant to measure, compare, and control your behavior. So that's what Jesus says, the main trouble with tradition, verse 3. Look what he says in Matthew 15. Matthew 15, verse 3 says, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your traditions? He's saying there's something wrong with man's traditions. You break the commandment of God for the sake of your traditions. Why is he saying there's problems with traditions? Because it's really simple. You have to think through this. Rules and laws of man, rules and laws of man have a way of becoming far more important than God's actual commands to all of us. It's what religion does. What does Jesus mean by traditions? Here's how I define traditions. Traditions are human inventions. They're man-made. They're made up. It does not say in the Old Testament to dip your hands into the water and go up to the elbows and let them drip off the fingertips. It's not in there. They made that up. These human inventions at first are meant to assist, to help you in your piety, to some of them are good suggestions, good ideas. But then over time, what happens to them, they turn into strict laws that control. And they become really suffocating. Paul calls this works of righteousness. Over time, they become standard identifiers to pu publicly show you are pleasing God the right way. And when they take hold of a religious community, when they really get embedded... They morph into unbreakable laws. And if you break them, you're out of the group. You're not considered godly. So what it does is it causes you to comply. I'll tell you, let me just give you some very straight up illustrations. When I was a kid, the church I went to, you entered the doors. When you entered the doors, you had to dip your fingers in a little bowl of water. You twirl them around a little bit, and then you go like this before you could enter the sanctuary. One day I didn't do it, and my grandmother hit me upside the head. What are you doing, young man? You get back here. You are unclean to go in there. Show me in the Bible where it talks about this. It doesn't. Where do we get it? It's made up. Driving a horse and buggy and not having electricity. Did you know that's not in the Bible? In some churches, to prove you are a true worshiper, you have to raise your hands at worship. If you don't, you probably don't have the Holy Spirit. And if you're not sure, you better do it anyway just to show people that you do have the Holy Spirit. And if you can cry while you do that, ooh, how dare you, Chris, criticize people's worship. I'm not. But I am saying if it becomes something you feel you have to do, then the actual tradition is more important than the actual meaning behind what you're doing. You're more concerned about what people think of you than you are about the God who you're singing to. Sometimes there are some songs that are so heavy, and as I contemplate them, I can't even sing them, realizing that God's listening to me. I, can re I use this a lot, but I remember when I was in youth group, we'd sing this song called Holiness. It goes like this, holiness, holiness is what I long for. Todd, do you remember that song? And then it says, brokenness, brokenness is what I need. And I'd say, you know what, we're not singing this because you kids don't mean a word of that. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. They run out of the, the service and then they go like swearing like crazy. I don't think you really mean that. Um, pastors in some denominations... Demand that you have a stiff white shirt, a blue crisp suit. You can get away with a blue blazer if you want to, but dark blue is the color. Crisp tie, polished shoes, and when you say God, you need an A-W to it, God. Now that's holy. That's the way to preach. Sinner's prayer. Have you ever said the sinner's prayer? You've never said the sinner's prayer. I'm not sure you're saved. 
Did they say the sinner's prayer? No, but they believe Jesus died and rose again on a cross and they're living for him. But did they say the sinner's prayer? Well, I don't know. They better say it. Why? Do you have a personal relationship with God? Well, I believe in him. No, no. Do you have a personal relationship with God? See, it's all about conforming to the words we want to use. Some churches have organs next to hymn number signs. That's the way to do it. Some people demand that you have no work around the yard on Sunday. You don't play on Sunday and you don't smile on Sunday. I'd rather you be grumpy on Sunday because you're holier when you're grumpy on Sunday. Go up to my grandfather and you don't bother grandpa on Sunday. Get away from me. Get him praying to God. Now that's holy, man. I mean, you're, you're so holy, you're angry. Some really religious people wear long wooden crosses and grow their beards down to their bellies wearing black robes and they go like this with their hands. That's holy. Or some people just say just over and over again when they pray. I just... I just that. Now, now, what I'm trying to say is we adopt traditions, we look at how people do things, and we say, whoa, they must be doing it right. So we do what they do, thinking now we are holy. And what Jesus is saying, stop it. It's not about the outward and if your hands are a little dirty or what you eat. Stop it. Everything's about what's in here. And this is where he gets into the lips, the tongue. These are the next two things. Actually, let me just go back one second. I just need to kind of explain something to you. You see in verse 4, what Jesus is mad about, the Pharisees had this deal called Corbin. The Pharisees made this weird rule. If you took some of your money and property and you set it aside and you say, this is set aside for the temple, set aside for God, it's called Corbin. And they would allow people to do that and they would do it for one reason, so they could kind of store it for later. That's mine. And if I call it Corbin, nobody can touch it. And I don't even have to give it to my poor old mom and dad. And then you'd go to the priest and say, hey, can I have some of that money? And they'd say, what is it for? And then they'd pray and they'd give you some of that money. And so what was happening is some of the priests were hoarding their wealth and not giving to their poor parents because they called it Corbin. And Jesus is saying, so you mean to tell me, you mean to tell me your stupid human traditions are more important than honoring your father and your mother? Your father and your mother who gave up everything when you were a baby and had diapers? And now you think all that money is yours to hoard? What about the people you're supposed to honor? You've destroyed God's law to keep your own traditions. And I dare say we do that a lot. Have you ever noticed some of the meanest people are the most religious? Which, let's go to the next one. So instead of condemning someone because you have dirt, because your hands are dirty, Jesus says the issue is with the tongue because it's the tongue that hides the heart. The heart is really where wickedness dwells, but it's the tongue that covers it up. That's why it's so bad. Look at 7 to 9. You hypocrites, that means you mask-wearing liars. That's, could you imagine saying that to a leader these days? Oh, you'd get in big trouble. He's saying this to the Jews, you know, the guy's in charge. This would be like going up to, to a senator. Or, you know, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. Wouldn't you love to do that to your politician? Oh, I'd love to do that. But set that aside, Christian, not allowed to do that. Well, be nice. Let's be nice. Jesus was never nice. All right, verse 7. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, and he said, this people honors me with their lips, with their words, but their hearts, they're far away. In other words, they're closed off. Boy, can they lie. So the problem with lips is this. This love of self, this self-protection, I don't want you to really see me, is... It's protected under layers, layers. I mean, we have layers of well-told lies. The phrase, honor me with their lips, means a religious person will use words and visible outward actions to sound and look godly. 
It's easy to do, actually. God is good all the time, brother, all the time. You go out in your car and you hit your kid. When you focus primarily on the outward, the heart is kept distanced from God. This is the problem. The Living Bible uses that word vain, you see, in verse um, 9, in vain do they worship me. The Living Bible says, this kind of worship, it's a farce. It's a farce. It's fake. We are experts. I mean, if you think about it, we are experts at using words to make other people think I am something when I am not. It's part of our existence. We do it all the time. I hide my falseness under layers of well-told lies. And religious lies are the best lies ever told because they actually make people think, not only am I bad, but I am holy, really good person. I have seen people who get drunk on Saturday, sleep around, curse like a sailor all week, but when Sunday comes, these same people can sing songs during worship, that will have you crying. They'll say prayers. It makes them seem so close to God. And act very pious. But then when their brother has a need, they don't have time for him. Doesn't John say, you know what the true religion is? Is loving your brother in need. Here's a question I have. Can mere words turn a sinner into a saint? Because I use the right words can that turn a sinner into a saint? Can a man who's been married for, let's say, 20, 30 years and has been mean get saved in a month and then everything changes because his words are different now? <clears throat> Religious words and empty traditions have no power. None. The tongue is very convincing. I mean, let's, like, again, I don't mean to be political, but look at it, just... Just look at the State of the Union address. Right after the State of the Union address, the whole next day, both sides, one side's trying to say it was terrible. The other side is saying it's the greatest thing ever. And now I read something today. His poll numbers have shot up. Who cares? It's just words. They're reading off a teleprompter. Can we see action? And I want to see that in the church too. I love God. Do you? Man, we need a lot of people that need help. What is worse is when words are used to convince people you love God. Using a religious tone and saying words that sound holy can fool masses of people, but not God. And that's what verse 12 is all about. Look at verse 12. Verse 12 is talking about when God calls you out or convicts you, people don't like it. Then the disciples came and said to him, so you can imagine disciples, they're coming up to Jesus. And the disciples said to him, Jesus, uh, do you know that the Pharisees, they were offended? Oh, 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 Jesus, they don't like what you say. Can you tone it down? Jesus, don't tell the truth. Tone it down. You're making the leaders mad at you. You know, the really important people don't like what you have to say. Can you tone it down? down who here's here's my question who has the right in our culture to be offended why do people think they have the right to be offended why do some people think it's okay for others to be terrified of their opinion or why are there people who 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 you must walk around on eggshells why do you like having people in your house Walk around on eggshells around you. Why do you have a right to command and be in charge? I, I can't wait to see when controlling people really see Jesus. I think he's going to say, who do you think you are? Who do the Pharisees think they are offended at the Son of God who casts the scars in the sky? We are so proud of ourselves. It's crazy. We should be willing to have people... Tell us the truth, even if it hurts, our, it hurts our feelings. Because Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So that means my own heart will deceive myself about myself. That's what humility is, is to allow people to speak into my life. 
I find it interesting, I'm thinking through this, I find it interesting how we show more deference to wicked and angry people who are easily offended than we are towards Christians who speak the truth. Shh, shh, be, don't be bold about what you say. A non-Christian might hear you and they might be offended. I find there's two types of non-Christians. Don't let that, first of all, don't let that stop you from telling the truth. Because there's two types of non-Christians. The first kind of non-Christian are those who are looking to be offended. So no matter what you say, they're going to be offended. But the second type of non-Christian, they are looking for people who just tell the truth and shoot straight. Most really angry people who get mad at hearing the truth are the ones who don't want to either lose their power or they don't want to be exposed and they don't want to change their behavior. So they get mad, and they criticize you, and you tell the truth. So what is the truth? The truth is, really the problem with human beings is what lies inside. Look what he says, 13 to 20. Every plant that my Heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone, meaning let the Pharisees who are getting offended at me, just let them alone. They're blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach, it's expelled? So, okay, so you eat some dirt. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go through your body and be expelled anyhow. It doesn't really affect you that much. In fact, sometimes, you know, it's pretty good to eat dirt. It's good for you. Do you know that? That's why some people drink that rotten drink called kabucha. Why do you drink that? <laughs> gives me antioxidants and it gives, you know, whatever you call that. That's dirt. You're drinking dirt. Anyhow, <laughs> verse, uh, so Peter, uh, okay, 18, but what comes out of the mouth, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and it is this that defiles a person. For out of the house, heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. When people do th bad things, they do actions that are bad, they've been thinking about it before they've done it. These are what defile a person, Jesus says, but to eat with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile anyone. That doesn't defile anyone. So, basically, this statement shows Jesus, his complete authority over men. He can see into the heart, and he knows who really are his. That's what this is about, verse 13. He says, I, I don't really look at outward appearances. I'm looking, at, I'm looking for true disciples, and I know who they are. I know who they are because God has put his Holy Spirit. He's planted them, and he seals them with the promised Holy Spirit. So God knows who are his, and he can see inside the soul. It's sort of like, it reminds me of in the Old Testament before the Passover. Those who were his would take blood and put it on their mantles. And then when the killing angel of the Lord came by, oh, there is one of God's. And then they pass by. God knows if the Spirit's on your heart. But those who don't, he's going to root them up. And they're not going to be able to resist the angel of the Lord when they come for Jesus is telling, is Boyd still here? It reminds me of Boyd. I was out with Boyd one time. Boyd's out there. I went out, Boyd, Boyd goes to our church. He's a forester, and he cuts down huge acres of trees, but he'll mark trees he doesn't want cut down. So then the guys that come through to cut down the trees will cut down all the trees but the ones that have a mark. Anyhow, think about that. That's a parable. Those who have ears, let them hear. Anyhow, Jesus' um, Jesus' whole point here is he's telling those who have been cowering under religious authority, don't worry, let them go, don't worry. In fact, we all need to let offended people just wallow in their own misery and bitterness. So let, stop letting angry people intimidate you. Live above the threats of the proud. Even though they may gain a following, it doesn't mean they're right. That's some of the stuff Jesus is saying. What makes a person a saint? Their heart. Is their heart changed? We read down there that the Holy Spirit 
is given to those who have accepted Jesus by faith, shed abroad their hearts by the Holy Spirit. That's the point. So the final question, so the heart is where the monster lies, the heart is where the problem is, and then the heart, out of the heart comes wickedness. So the question is this, or you could say it like this, clean monsters, clean monsters, you can clean the monster all you want. He can have washed hands, he can wear a nice blazer, he can have a tie, he can have his hair above his collar, he can talk piously. Clean monsters still don't get into heaven. But dirty saints will. Think about that. In fact, if you are a saint, you're going to start cleaning your dirt as well. You just will want to. Because remember, love God, love God, and then do whatever you please. That's the point. So do you love God?